um, and that should give you a, um, a, a voting page. Uh, during the debate, um, we very much uh, encourage people to, uh, to first of all, follow our Twitter page, uh, uh, Twitter feed at Multi Debates, and also to tweet using the hashtag uh, Multi Debates in the plural. Um, if there's a fire, this obviously only applies to you who are physically here, but uh, if there's a fire, um, follow the fire exits um, and uh, go outside. You'll be directed outside by marshals, and then we meet on the other side of the road um, opposite the main entrance. Um, if you have a camera, please uh, don't use it. Um, if you have a phone, uh, please do use it for tweeting, but not for making phone calls. Um, Okay, so what we now have to do is to test the, um, uh, the online, uh, uh, well, in fact, we, we, yeah, we're testing the voting system. Uh, and so, we've, so we're going to test it with a, with a test question. Oh, they actually voted already, so... Okay, people have already started voting, which is good. Uh, so the question is, um, to what do the letters N-I-C-E refer on a nice biscuit? I don't know if you're familiar with nice biscuits, but they're... We've used them a lot to promote this uh, debate. Um, I don't care for them myself. They have a kind of coconutty flavor. Um, but if, uh, if you think that the answer is one, that the less letters N-I-C-E refer to the nice flavor of the, of the biscuit, then you should press one. If you think that it actually refers to the French town of Nice, you should press two. And if you think that the letters refer to the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, uh, then press three. Okay, so I can see our votes are climbing. Oh, wow, that's good. That's good. Okay, so we've got 270 votes and counting. 275, it seems to have more or less stopped there, so can we... Can we finalize that? Okay. So, um, I'm impressed, actually. I didn't know the answer to this. Um, but, uh, yes, the answer is indeed two. It's, uh, it refers to the town of Nice. Apparently, the, uh, the Nice, or the Nice biscuits, as we should now call them, um, were originally, they used to say fit and Nice made in Nice, um, and then they, uh, later on they took away the fit, uh, and it was just Nice. Um, so the answer is the French town of Nice. So if you go away from here having learnt nothing else, <laughs> at least you've, you've learnt now um, a little uh, tea time uh, conversation that you can have when the, when the Nice biscuits come out. So uh, on to the more uh, serious vote. Uh, so the motion before the House is... This has believed that the that Nice guideline CG178 psychosis and schizophrenia in adults is unbiased and evidence based. Um, so that, uh, if you uh, would like to vote for that motion, you press one. If you'd like to vote against the motion, you can press two. And if you're abstaining, which you can do because you haven't heard the evidence yet, uh, you can press three. Um, and we will be repeating this vote at the end of the uh, debate to see how the votes have changed. Okay, we know there are 275. Oh, there we are. We've got the last person. There we go. Okay, so so we have uh, 63 people um, believing that the uh, guidelines are unbiased and evidence-based. We have 85 people believing that they are not, and we have 127 uh, abstentions. I think that's probably the most abstentions that we've ever had. Uh, which may suggest that perhaps some people might not have actually read 
the nice guidelines from cover to cover, which is extraordinary. Um, so, uh, so hopefully this will, this will inform and educate you. Um, yeah, okay, so um, we've also been at the same time, now how do I do this, uh, Jean-Philippe, just to yeah. click, click on it. Um, earlier today we had an online poll on Twitter, and the results for that were 51% for and 49% against the motion, so a much more balanced um, uh, audience online. Um, we didn't give them the opportunity to, to abstain. Um, how do I get back to this? Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, th I'd like to thank um, Sophie Smart, who has uh, uh, been tireless in her efforts to uh, organize this debate. Uh, Jean-Philippe uh, Calvin, who you can see there, who's um, uh, organized the debate. Um, and Simon Kovalevsky, who's the uh, technical person that you saw here fixing the, um, the YouTube. So thanks very much for, um, uh, to him as well. Um, when you leave, uh, please, ha tempting as it may be, to take the um, <laughs> clickers home with you as a souvenir. Um, uh, please, we, we will need them next time, so please do remember to leave them behind. Um, so now um, I'm just going to uh, introduce our chairperson, and that is Professor Sarah Byford. Um, Sarah is Professor of Health Economics at, and uh, Director of King's Health Economics at King's College London. Um, so her work focuses, focuses on the economic evaluation of um, health interventions, um, and, and as part of her work, she does a lot of work with NICE um, uh, on various of their uh, committees. Uh, she notes on her, on her website um, uh, where she describes her work uh, that working with NICE has been one of her most rewarding roles because it's allowed her to get into many good arguments with many different people. So when we saw that, we thought that she was clearly, uh, who could be better qualified to, um, to chair a multi-debate on, uh, on some NICE guidelines. So I hope that we do have um, some good arguments uh, this evening. Um, so I'll hand over to Sarah. Thank you, James, and welcome everybody to this 54th Maudsley debate. I have been told that my role is to keep people to time, field questions from the audience, and keep things vaguely civilised. <laughs> the use of the term vaguely probably requires some specification, but I'm just going to take it to mean that I have to try and keep this house in order while not sucking all the fun out of it. <laughs> it is my absolute pleasure to be here as chair today. <clears throat> particularly as this evening's debate is one that's very close to my heart. As James mentioned, I've been involved a lot with NICE guideline development groups, and my personal opinion, I've always had a tendency to swing very wildly from, okay, this seems like a sensible approach to take, to, oh my God, you have got to be kidding me. So as a result, I'm still firmly stuck on the abstention fence, and I personally am very looking forward to seeing if any of our speakers on the panel today can pull me off onto one side or the other. Um, so onto our rather impressive panel. Our two speakers proposing the motion are Professor Sonia Johnson and Professor Steve Pilling. Uh, I'm going to give you a very brief bio and uh, then we'll get straight on to their talks. So Sonia is a consultant psychiatrist in early intervention for psychosis, and she's also professor of social and community psychiatry um, at University College London. Her research focuses primarily on the evaluation of complex interventions, um, and I know because I've worked with her, some of these include crisis care and early intervention. Um, Sonia likes the odd tweet, I noticed, Racking up over three and a half thousand to date, which is far more impressive than my um, attempt. Uh, they do focus mainly on mental health, but I'm particularly intrigued by the fact that they also focus on singing, but perhaps she can tell us about that later. Notably, given today's topic, Sonia was a member of the Guideline Development Group um, for the last, last night's nice psychosis guideline update. Next to her, Steve Pilling. Um, Steve is Professor of Clinical Psychology, also, interestingly, at University College London, so quite a lot riding on the outcome today um, <laughs> for our UCL neighbours. Um, he is Director of the National Collaborating Centre um, 
for mental health, which has been, as I'm sure a lot of you know, responsible for a huge number of nice clinical practice guidelines in mental health. Um, he's also head of the British Psychological Society's Centre for Outcomes Research and Effectiveness. Um, he's been principal investigator and collaborator on a huge number of large-scale trials, again, um, usually evaluating complex interventions, and I was intrigued to discover that he spans the whole range, um, including depression, insomnia, social anxiety, autism, alcohol dependence, just to name a few. So that's our two who are speaking for the motion. Our two speakers against the motion are Associate Professor Mark Taylor, and Professor Clive Adams. I'm going to start with Mark, um, partly because, as you've already heard, he is primarily responsible for us all being here today, so thank you for that, Mark. Um, Mark is a consultant psychiatrist working at the Royal Edinburgh Hospital. He interestingly trained here at the Maudsley and the Institute of Psychiatry, but unlike some of us, he did manage to escape. He's then spent quite a bit of time, it seems, flitting between Scotland and Australia, so I guess he likes to avoid the Scottish winters every now and then. He's worked as a consultant in Melbourne, Glasgow and Brisbane, and he is Honorary Senior Lecturer at the University of Edinburgh, as well as Associate Professor at the University of Queensland. He's published wild, why, why? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit Freudian, wasn't it? <laughs> He's published widely, particularly focusing on schizophrenia, psychosis and antipsychotic medication. And of particular relevance to today's debate is he chaired the Scottish Intercollegiate Guideline Network Schizophrenia Guideline, otherwise known as Sign 131. And finally, and of absolutely no relevance to the debate whatsoever, but my favourite fact, other career highlights include working in a pork pie factory. <laughs> Our final speaker, Professor Clive Adams, uh, was born, apparently, where the Mourne Mountains sweep down to the sea. Now, I'm sorry, I had to throw it in. I also had to look it up, because I'm not very good at geography, but I did find it. Clive qualified in medicine at Queen's University in Belfast and left the mountains to begin a career in psychiatry in Bradford subsequently working in London, Oxford, Leeds, and Nottingham. He humbly suggests that a year in the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine almost did him in, and working with Professor Michael Gelder and Sir Ian Chalmers in Oxford uh, completed his downfall. <laughs> However, he clearly picked himself up and is currently coordinating editor of the Cochrane Schizophrenia Group based in the University of Nottingham and he has a distinguished record, like all of them here, um, designing and leading trials in the management of people with schizophrenia. So, that's our speakers, and each one is going to be given six minutes, and six minutes only, to present their arguments. And I would like that to encourage them to keep to the point, keep to the motion before us, and keep to time, as I will cut you off if necessary. Um, please do also report any conflicts of interest that you think are particularly pertinent to this debate. Finally, um, much as I do like a good argument, uh, I'm keen for a fairly clean debate, uh, so can all speakers and members of the audience um, refrain from any personal attacks and remain respectful. And if you are asking a question, please wait for the microphone, given that this is being live streamed, um, and please tell us who you are and keep your questions brief. Thank you very much. So, our first speaker is Sonia Johnson. Okay. Please don't start the clock while I look for my presentation. Um, <laughs> please. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that introduction. I promise no singing today. <laughs> ending. <laughs> all right, so as far as I'm aware, first of all, God was not actually involved in writing the 2014 guideline, 
So actually, the original version is rather implausible. It's rather unlikely that any large document could be entirely free of conscious or unconscious bias, or that every single line of it is based in evidence. So as proposer of the motion, I'm using that privilege to invite you to consider the following slightly revised version of the motion, which is that this House believes that the Guideline Development Group did their best to avoid bias and to base guidance on any evidence that was available. So that's the motion I would like to debate this evening. Also, while I'm very grateful to be invited to these august surroundings and this lively debate, I do have one other comment, which is I think you've got us backwards in that you've got the defence speaking before the prosecution, and I therefore have to try and anticipate what they're going to say as well as mounting a defence against it. Fortunately, some of the discussion has already taken place in the British Journal of Psychiatry and elsewhere. And this is, I think, disposed of some of the arguments. Now, these are some of the original arguments which involve too much emphasis on medication, me not being a psychopharmacologist, that's definitely true, um, too many recommendations about CBT and so on. However, what seemed to have happened with those particular arguments was that the people making them had not actually realised that those areas were not reviewed in this guideline. So this was a limited update of the 2009 guideline and the 2009 guidance on medication, CBT and so on, which did involve lots of very brainy psychopharmacology inputs, had not been changed. So this, I think, left two major arguments which were new for the 2014 guidance and which Mark and colleagues used in their most recent paper about the guidelines to argue that they were biased. And those are the two arguments I'm going to focus on for the rest of this brief presentation. So I'm talking about the ones that appear in this most recent April paper. So one argument was that the guideline is unjustified in suggesting that it's reasonable to offer people with at-risk mental states who are thought at risk of developing psychosis, that it's not reasonable to recommend CBT for them. And the reason they gave was that there are, we're not good enough yet at detecting people who are going to go on to develop psychosis. There are basically too many false positives to intervene. Fortunately, as you'll see here, the guideline agrees that you have to proceed with great caution, and the guideline does not actually advocate any form of early detection. It doesn't advocate that we go out and actively look for people who are in at-risk mental states unless you'd like to join this lady with her crystal ball. So what the recommendations relate to is people who find their way to early intervention services even though they're not being actively looked for in other services or in the community. And we know that the group of people who are diagnosed as having at-risk mental states who've sought help are quite a distressed group, that they don't function well, and that most of them, if they don't go on to develop psychosis, do develop another psychiatric disorder. Now, what evidence is there about what to do with this distressed group who are seeking help and not functioning well? Well, I'd suggest that there's a pretty good consensus from recent meta-analyses and commentaries on the evidence about interventions for those help seekers, which suggests basically that antipsychotics are to be used with caution because the num although there's some effect, it's not justified by the very high number ne needed to treat. So basically this issue of false positives that CBT also has a small effect, but that there's less of a problem with side effects and that a benefit is you may treat some of the comorbid conditions. So it's reasonable to cautiously offer that and also justified as general support and watching and waiting. So in this area, the NICE guideline basically agrees with the other major meta-analyses 
all of which have interesting One authors minute, who are both psychiatrists and psychologists. In my final minute, what would you do with Josh? He's a university student who's been hearing voices for a while and thinks there's a conspiracy against him. He's willing to engage, he won't take medication. He's not detainable, he's not that much of a risk that he could be sectioned. Nice says, on the basis of one pilot trial, you, could, you must recommend medication first. You could also, if declined, offer him CBT for a month, then review, monitor his distress all the time. I would argue that even though that's a, to a large extent an expert recommendation, not one based in substantial evidence, given that we know CBT and family therapy are effective, given that we have one pilot style study that has some promise, while at the moment that's a reasonable thing to recommend, it's not demonstrating bias. And finally, let's not have any more psychiatry versus psychology wars, which this seems a manifestation of. It's just a waste of time when there's so much else to do and so much else to worry about. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Next up, we have Mark, please. Six minutes doesn't seem long from up here. <laughs> ah, that's the long version. I'm not sure I'm going to bother with the slides, actually. I should show with my disclosures. Uh, picked up the wrong bunch of slides, so I'm not sure I'm going to bother with slides particularly. Uh, I've got some disclosures. I have uh, uh, had a contact with the pharmaceutical industry in the past, uh, but the main disclosure really is I'm a jobbing psychiatrist. I saw two people with schizophrenia this morning, two with personality disorder. I work day to day with psychologists. And uh, let's move on, perhaps. Yeah, the CG178. It starts. Uh, it started from CG82. I don't know if you remember CG82. That was the 2007-2008 iteration. And vis-a-vis -vis psychopharmacology, they said, look, guys, we've studied this for two years, 600 pages of forest plots. When you've got a case of psychosis, choose an antipsychotic. That's what the recommendation was. So the updates four or five years later, as Sonia says, there was no new data included in this 178 from the CG82. What they did include was CG155, which was the child and adolescent schizophrenia, which was actually quite a carefully considered rational guideline. If you look at the language in CG155, you can see that they use words like consider CBT in the at-risk mental state. And by the way, Jim Van Oss, Robin Murray, authorities from somewhere around here, consider the at-risk mental state to be a Little construct, uh, little constructive validity uh, and lots of false predictive value. And in fact, even the DSM and ICD have rejected it as a, con a discrete entity. And of course, CBT for distress, CBT for depression, we know that works. That's not in dispute. In SIGN 131, the tartan version of this nice guideline, we too go on about patient choice, patient-centered care, uh, CBT, social uh, interventions. Of course, these are crucial in a serious illness like schizophrenia. Uh, that's not the point. The point is that some of the recommendations in NICE uh, didn't go, uh, went beyond the evidence base. Here's an evidence base that NICE didn't consider, for example, which shows quite conclusively, this is the maestro from Munich, Stefan Leucht, uh, showing that medication, yes, it's got problems, uh, but it does definitely work. Number needed to treat, about nine. It's not for everyone, but it does work if you've got established schizophrenia. So there is, uh, just in, like in SIGN 131, there is a, an emphasis, quite rightly, on psychological interventions. In SIGN 131, we concluded art therapy was of no value. CG 178 didn't, in, didn't bother to conclude, Mike, didn't involve Mike, Rawford, Mike Crawford's Matisse trial, the biggest single trial. Peter McKenna has written about the selective use of meta-analyses in CG 178. Arms we've talked about. Paul Hutton's a psychologist now up in Edinburgh, 
And he himself, who was involved in the Tony Morrison study that was picked out there, which, by the way, had more authors than participants at the end of the study, uh, he himself has pointed out, Paul, being a clinical psychologist, that actually all the single-blind trials have been negative. Quite a lot of expense and effort have gone to those. And even ones with active comparators show pretty weak results. Here's Cochrane. Now, Cochrane is the sort of byword and unbiased. I, I should say, for, uh, before I started, actually, that I, I came to praise Caesar, not to bury him. NICE is internationally recognized for its high-quality evidence-based output. We need people like NICE telling us to, to rebut against the more obvious signs of bias. But just because I wrote a tendentious editorial doesn't mean that the emperor's new clothes can't be questioned. We, we, isn't it to question is scientific. To, to debate is scientific. We can't just say, well, this is beyond debate now. That's, uh, that's where all of this started. And what did Cochrane say? Well, the 2013 Cochrane said what you can read there in red. 2000, the latest, this is not actually not out yet, they've considered far more papers uh, with active uh, trial RCTs and ended up with the safe. This is not my data. This is not even Clive's data. This is Cochrane data, independent data. So CBT is great, but you know, Jan Scott showed it's not really that good for bipolar, and we would argue it's not necessarily good for psychosis itself. It certainly might reduce distress. Let's compare CBT with medications, because you know med a lot of uh, the work is based on the premise, like Sonia said. That, uh, and by the way, Sonia is the preeminent academic in my mind for the crisis home treatment stuff that I do. Uh, let's put it into context. Go back to Munich again. Our maestro Stefan Loink. What does he say about antipsychotics versus placebo? Number needed to treat about not too bad actually. Effect size of about five. Number needed to treat about four or five. The best metro analysis, my view, for CBT psychosis, David Turner, a psychologist in Scotland and the Dutch group, they showed an effect size of about 0.2. So a small effect size. And yes, we've already said CBT might reduce distress or arousal. What about bias? Bias is everywhere, as Sonia said. Here are three beautiful women, as far as I'm concerned. One minute. Can an institution be biased? There's lots of writings, uh, not just about this particular guideline, David Coghill, a child psychiatrist, professor in Dundee, he thinks the ADHD guidelines biased. There was all that scandal about the dementia thing. Samir, who's sitting at the back, has recently written about the bipolar. Even NICE's own triennial review said stakeholders have registered concern. That's not me, that's not even Samir, that's NICE, reflecting on the process that they've been through. So, you know, NICE is good, but it can be open to question. Other conflicts with vis-a-vis -vis this guideline, yes, pharma is important, and of course, if you're taking a sandwich from the pharmaceutical industry, NICE will never have you on the board. Uh, but other uh, conflicts of interest are well described. So, for example, in psychology studies, what about non-disclosure of publication royalties? Uh, Dave, you know, lots of people have got publication royalties out of this. They've got career alignments to these studies as well. I'll finish up. So. Thanks for your attention. You know, for a serious illness like schizophrenia, we need all the effective evidence-based treatments we can uh, muster, of course. That's beyond dispute. And of course, we want to work, just like Sonia said, as part of a team. Uh, this is not a turf war. However, well-intentioned guidelines should be questioned, can be questioned. This is not the emperor's new clothes. Doesn't sound like finishing up to me, I'm afraid, Mark. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs>
that somehow or other, in the way that Sonia referred to, that somehow uh, medication uh, and psychological interventions are somehow in competition in the treatment of psychological disorders. That's very clearly not the case, and that's not what's spelled out in the guideline, the most effective in combination. Uh, and you can, and I'll come on to this in a minute, select a wide range of meta-analyses, and if you want to peruse them, you can probably find several different and rather conflicting perspectives on how effective CBT, or for that matter, family interventions are in the treatment of schizophrenia. Uh, but actually, when you do that, what you need to do is what we do in the preparation of a NICE guideline, is look at relevant endpoints. And those endpoints might not just be, as I think is the case in a number of these meta-analyses, the end of treatment, but look about what happens in the longer term. You've got to be careful about how you go about selecting trials, because selection bias is, as we know, an important factor. I just want now to just reassure people about the process that we adopt at NICE, and centrally <laughs> underpinning that is the notion of what Norman Daniels, a Harvard ethicist, and Jim Sabine, a psychiatrist at Harvard, would call accountability for reasonableness. And that's summarized in the following statement, that no single set of principles can guarantee a just outcome when decisions are made about finite resources. And that's central to the NICE process. It's a deliberative one which says we might not be able to agree on the outcome of a review of evidence, and that's clearly the case today, but what we can do is agree on the process by which we go about that and try and ensure that it's the fairest and most transparent process. And NICE has, has been acknowledged, has led that. And for example, if you look at the first schizophrenia guideline and subsequent updates, which were rated on behalf initially by Wolfgang Gabel of the WHO, we came out methodologically, what I think politely would describe, about a country mile ahead of any other guideline. So there's not just myself with my interests setting out the case that NICE is probably if not uh, the most effective method we have for developing guidelines. We have uh, reassurance from a range of other bodies. What NICE also does, what we try to do in the guidelines we've developed, is take account of the best available evidence. And as we heard from Sonia, that's not always a meta-analysis of a large number of very well-conducted randomized controlled trials. It actually is central, though, to the process of decision-making. And what we do in decision-making, NICE, is two things that I think guarantee that we, t we try and reduce that bias uh, to the minimum. And we do that first by carefully selecting a guideline committee. Uh, we're very transparent and open about the interests of that guideline committee. These, this is a public declaration. You can look on the website uh, and look at them. And we use scientific evidence. It's as un underpinned by the social value judgments that NICE have had there since the very beginning. And we develop recommendations that we think are important for the context in which they're going to be used. So again, that example of, of Josh that Sonia quoted earlier set out a very difficult issue where actually, you know, you're not quite sure what to do. Uh, can we help clinicians? Can we help service users? Can we help their, their families by coming to the best decision uh, that we think on the available evidence? And when we do that, we produce evidence, we produce a recommendation, which is there as a guide to clinical judgment. It is not a substitution. It's not a substitute for it. And the slavish following in an in a, in a unthinking way of nice guidelines is probably as dangerous as simply ignoring them. So uh, we're not there to prescribe and uh, uh, specify what people are doing. We're there to analyze the evidence in the best way we can and try and use that to inform judgments. And just to, to finish uh, how, how, how that goes on, as you will know, when a guideline is completed, uh, it's sent out for public consultation. Every single recommendation, and crucially, the arguments underpinning those recommendations are subject to review. We will get, uh, for example, around 700 pages of comments on a clinical guideline. We have to go through every single one of those look at what the, recommend, what the comment is, and very simply, it follows usually a rule of three. There are about 30% of them that are extremely helpful. We respond to them, we change them. There are about 30% probably haven't read it, or they haven't read the scope, or they're a bit off, off key. 
and actually we just politely point that out. And then there are another 30%, perhaps, which we disagree with, and we point that out. All of that information is then subject to scrutiny by internal committees at NICE, and if we've not responded properly to it, uh, then we have to account for it. And it's that process that I've set out there that I think guarantees you an unbiased guideline on which you, patients, and others are able to make the best judgment in their own interest. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And now we're on to our final speaker, Clive Adams. I'm not tweeting. I'm, uh, I'm just uh, um, getting me timer ready. Uh, oh, actually, I've got to get my slides ready. How do I advance it, actually? How do I advance it? Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, right now, here we go. Start. Thank you very much. It is an honour to be asked to these things. Uh, I'll speak up. Um, this is what your job is. Your job is not to say as to whether it's maybe try to avoid bias. Your job is to decide as to whether it is unbiased and evidence-based. Not whether it's written by well-meaning and able people, but is it unbiased? Here is the planting in a wonderful garden in Holland that we were there a couple of weeks ago. Nobody would call it unbiased. It is a thing of beauty. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily ugly, but don't tell me it's not biased. And on that theme, I fed the whole of the guideline into a wordle. And this is what you get. And I think that reflects rather good bias, praiseworthy bias of patient-centered care, thinking about people, people with schizophrenia. So please remember, even if you disagree, it's not really what you came to hear, I know. You want a bit of blood in the carpet, I know. And I'll give you a bit of that. But... Do, even if you disagree with what we say, do remember that, that there's maybe appropriate and positive biases in the nice as well. Can institutions like institutions collectively be biased? Well, here's work of Schoolgirl in Nottingham, where we, uh, oh, on, um, where we looked at the randomized controlled trials coming out of the Russell Group universities uh, and looked at the chances of them being statistically significant. If you're, uh, they're all far too positive. Uh, but if you really want a positive trial, go to Sheffield. Institutions assuredly can collectively be biased. Can publications be biased? We all know they can be. Uh, like a gift from heaven. This arrived uh, there last month in the British Journal of Psychiatry and uh, with, with Tim Kendall et al. And I, I, I don't matter what it says, it's quite clear that he is very articulate in displaying his allegiance bias. Now, I don't know what that means, I don't know how potent that is, but it's bias. And maybe there's 1.2 million reasons per year, at least, for that to happen. It's difficult to avoid bias. Can people be biased? All right, hold your hands up if you're unbiased. Um, just for viewers, there's not a hand going up. <laughs> it's difficult, including our opponents here. You know, include, you know, you've seen it here in the 52nd uh, Mosley debate. Cochrane is riven with its own biases, ill-informed and naive biases. It's really problematic. But then there's Pat McGorry, who, excuse me, is a wonderful researcher. Is a wonderful researcher. But not, his worst enemy wouldn't call him lazy. He's published the most extraordinary amount on early intervention. He has undertaken five meta-analyses that I could find, and not a bit of wonder. They're all very positive. He has an, a, an investment that's enormous there, and it's really difficult to avoid that. I know personally it is. So let's apply the McGorry test to the panel. And I got it wrong here, so uh, in bits of this. 
So I looked up and psychosis. Those authors and psychosis. Not a bit of wonder, they're interested in psychosis. I looked up and cognitive, and I wasn't sure S. Johnson is a particularly difficult name to, to spot accurately. Um, but and cognitive. And antipsychotic. And I think there's a feel there of a bias, is there not? A career bias. Is nice bias. Nearly finished, I think. Uh, so I fed the whole I fed the treatment part of it into uh, text mining. It's great. It links concepts together. So I did the treatment concepts I do and then plucked out. There were the drug ones, the psychological ones, and others I couldn't really classify. And you draw a graph. There it is. I think that indicates, the machine indicates that there's a bias in there. Unavoidable, I would say. So here's the research recommendations. I'm not say, saying that these are not absolutely crucially important. But do you think that these are the only really important things to come out of a guideline of such importance? You know, you can point at different bits of bias here and there, you know, but I thought that was a good example of a worrying set of recommendations and really limited considering the amount we do not know about the care of people with schizophrenia. So, do bear this in mind. pros and the cons of pulling both ways, but it's biased. And thank you. Thank you, Clive. Now, if I could have my panel back, please. So we now open it up to the floor and um, potentially to those of you tweeting from outside as well, if anybody manages to hand me some questions whilst I'm doing this. Um, so we have uh, about 15, 20 minutes um, for questions. So who would like to start? I've got one right at the top corner. Is that working okay? Yeah. Hi there, I'm Samir Johar. I work here some of the time as I work as a clinician as well. My question is to Professor Pilling. I could not agree with you further that you have to be very clear in what your outcome measure is when you're conducting meta-analyses and when you're giving recommendations. I would like to ask what was the outcome measure that was used in 2003 when NICE recommended CBT for schizophrenia? And I'd like to ask him what the evidence was when that was re-reviewed, because it was psychotic symptoms. And when we looked at it and all the meta-analytic data, that was the original evidence used for the recommendation for CBT. And you can't change the goalposts once it's already happened. You can't change your outcome measure to reflect what, you, what it is that you want to say, because that just, just doesn't sound fair. Well, my, my response to that is, and, uh, is that I didn't quite spell this out at the beginning, but when we revise any piece of guidance, what we do is we produce a scope, and that scope sets out the purpose of that guideline, and it also sets out what the preferred outcome measures are. Uh, and I think what we saw in a, a move between uh, 2003, 2009, 2012, um, is a shift in the scope, a shift in the focus of interest, and consequently upon that, then the nature of the outcome would change. That's consulted on widely, it was agreed on, and that formed the basis on which the guideline group was appointed. Now, the guideline group was appointed after that scope had been agreed, uh, and were asked to do a particular job, and as Sonia set out, that had a narrower focus. So my response to that would be, as I said, we consulted on it, we took a view, uh, and on the basis of that, the guideline committee then had a scope to work with. 
Who's next? Lady right at the front. Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to say that um, oh, my name is Cheryl Prax from Speak Out Against Psychiatry. Um, I would like to say that um, psychiatry is very heavily drug-based, and so the NICE guideline might seem biased um, in that way and might be biased to um, psychological therapies because psychiatry is so drug-based. Um, and I would disagree with Mark Taylor about... Um, the, that about the drugs are better than placebo because long-term studies show that the worst outcome. And I would ask Mark Taylor, would he intervene in the case of Garth Daniels in Melbourne who has had over 90 electroshocks now, one after the other? Thank you. Well, I, I must say I don't know anything about Garth Daniels. Uh, I think what we're trying to say is that medication is just one part of a treatment strategy. So, for example, in this guideline, CG178, they say during the first month of psychosis, which is a very distressing, alarming period for those people who've been through it and those people who have family members and who are even looked after it like I have, uh, that medication can be one part of a useful strategy. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Equally, we're not saying that psychological interventions are not important. Of course they are. When we did the side guideline, something simple like social skills training was highly effective. As Steve pointed out, family interventions are very important. Uh, what's interesting to me is that in an affluent city like Edinburgh, we can't get a psychologist. Even if you wanted to refer someone for CBT, P, you've got an 18-month waiting list. It's crazy. So I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on that particular question, but to, you know, what we're trying to do is just... Uh, rectify what seems a bit of a, an imbalance in this particular guideline. Okay. I, I don't think that's an entirely accurate representation of what is said about that initial month, because what it explicitly refers to is that people, if they don't wish to take medication, that people should be told that CBT works better with medication, that if they continue to refuse medication, they could then be offered CBT, but the risk, distress, so on, must be kept under review, and that after a month you need to again review the case for giving antipsychotics. Actually, I suspect some people would see that as, as a relatively conservative one, and that throughout the guideline, actually the suggestion is that you offer people with psychosis medication first and that you warn them of the consequences of not taking it. And the Morrison trial on which the suggestion that it might be okay to try just CBT is based is explicitly about people who refuse to take medication. And those people are a very clinically problematic group whom we all see, the people where there isn't the justification for sectioning them, but they're not well and they won't accept or they won't consistently take antipsychotics and I'd argue it's very important that's who it's about and it's very important to have a sensible strategy within the limited evidence that's available for that group. Thank you. The room's gone quiet so I'm going to jump in. I'll get to you next. <laughs> uh, I'm going to allude slightly more to some of the issues that I had with panels um, and one of them is in relation to um, the fact that when you join one of these guideline development groups, a lot of the work scoping and deciding on what reviews to do has already been made. Um, I don't know if that was an issue in this guideline, but it's certainly been an issue in some of the ones I've been involved in, and it's led to huge frustration um, from, the, from the guideline development group because actually they didn't have any say in, in what was, was scoped, and I wondered if that was true in this case. Yeah, and I think that, that's right. It's very important to understand that whatever further evidence was around about CBT for psychosis, we could not look at it. You know, we were explicitly directed not to change anything in the sections on medication and CBT for psychosis, except there was a limited permission to incorporate 
some of the guidelines from the psychosis in children and adolescents work, but otherwise the rest of it was just off bounds, basically. Uh, uh, just to reassure people, though, I, Sonia's absolutely right, but just to reassure people that this isn't a sort of uh, whimsical decision on, on, on the part of NICE, any update that NICE does is done on the basis of a careful review of new evidence that has come through since the guideline was published and an assessment is made by the surveillance team in NICE as to whether or not uh, any particular area of the guideline warrants an update. So although it can be uh, occasionally, as Sarah says, frustrating for guideline members, the view has all, the, 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 the position has already been reviewed and as I said earlier in response to the first question, that has been consulted on. It can be tough, but it's also trying to manage a, what otherwise would be a, a, a pretty unmanageable job. Thank you. Over at the front, please. Thanks. Hello. I'm Andre Tomlin from Mental Health. I should have coughed before you gave me the microphone. Um, I'm really interested in Clive's uh, guideline development group slide. Uh, and the PubMed searches that shows the kind of interests of those people. And I wanted to ask Mark um, how that compares with the SIGN guideline development group. Thanks for that. Clive actually has a si slide set that he's not shown comparing the SIGN and NICE guideline makeup committee. So, for example, on SIGN, which took us over two and a half years, my co chair was Andrew Gumley from the University of Glasgow, professor of psychology there. And actually, there's a lot of overlap between the SIGN, as you'd expect with the evidence. Uh, between sign and nice, that's not the point. Um, we had patient or service user and carer representatives. Uh, so we like to think we were fairly balanced, uh, and certainly the psychiatrists were not the dominant force within the group. I have a question from Twitter from at sectioned. Uh, the question is what involvement do patients have in developing NICE guidelines, which I guess is for Steve? Well, uh, Service users, carers have a central role in the uh, development of NICE guidance. So every guideline, every guideline schizophrenia, varies occasionally with guidelines, for example, with children. We will have two service users as members of the guideline. We will have a carer. They operate as full members of a guideline, have the same involvement, the same decision-making role as any other member of the guideline. We recognize that sometimes for some people, Taking that on can be quite a challenge. NICE have a uh, public and patient uh, participation group whose job is to support people with additional training and additional support in order to do that. They are a central and valued bit of all NICE guidelines. I would like to echo that. The committees I was involved in all had a quite, actually quite much bigger representation than you're suggesting. Um, but I suspect that might be the population. They were young, they were looked after. Um, and they um, made all the difference to, uh, to me and how I felt about developing guidelines. And certainly there were two, well, no, three very present and vocal experts by experience who are service users and two further ones who are carers who were there throughout the psychosis guideline development process. Okay. We have a question over here. Uh, could I just say, Sarah, Sorry. that wh whilst I think we're lucky in the UK, there's nothing li really like NICE or SIGN elsewhere in the world. You know, the, when I've worked in Australia, I've been in the Netherlands, America, they rely on what I call consensus guidelines, which is a group of boring old men often uh, sitting in a room coming up with what they regard as expert opinion. So, you know, whilst we're having a bit of a dig today, let's keep it in perspective that NICE and SIGN, I think, are laudable institutions. Hello, my, my name is Tom. I'm a self-employed philosopher and freelance psychotic. I previously took the wonderfully diabetes-causing medication, Elanzapine, for several years, and I've been drug-free now for over three. Um, I just want to make two points. In the borough we're in, well, Lambeth next door, they've been able to cut youth crime by 40% by revisioning crime as mental illness. That's a, almost a half rate. But the basis of that would be the then business secretary, Vince Cable's announcement in 2011 that the pharmaceutical industry will be used to replace the UK's 
economic dependency on financial services, surely the real bias and evidence for revisioning psychosis is a long-term market drive, economic one, to privatize the police service. you, Mark, because you have a previous contract with Otsuka, yeah? And they have, uh, they're working with Proteus Technologies. I um, don't, don't know the organization you're referring to. I'm uh, sorry, I, I read, I, I was able to read the O2, o, O-T-S-U-K-A, Otsuka. Otsuka, yeah, Otsuka, Otsuka who makes Abilify the Proteus Technologies are working with to put the microchips to guarantee compliance into the medication. So maybe it'd be best directed at you to... Well, the, this is not a ba debate about pharma, to my mind. You know, pharma... Uh, there's been other debates about that. Uh, but it's worth bearing in mind that the pharmaceutical industry create jobs. They innovate treatments that are evidence-based. Yes, they have problems, but they're not all satanic. No, it's not religious. Okay, we've got time for a couple more, and I have two hands. There's a lady in the top corner, and then the gentleman top in the middle. So, um, I'd like to ask what sign uh, recommends for people that are not uh, happy to take um, antipsychotics in that first month, or when they're first becoming unwell. If, if, if sign recommends question. something different or... What does sign recommend for people? What does sign recommend for people who are not happy to take antipsychotics? Is that right? Yeah. 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 It's a good question. There isn't a specific recommendation. Interestingly, we do recommend CBT, uh, but just not as strongly. So it's, like I said, if you look at the sign guideline, for example, we reject art therapy. Interestingly, the art, I don't know if there are art therapists in the room, they were surprisingly militant when we suggested that. Uh, we do recommend family intervention, social skills training, uh, and CBT. It's, as Sonia pointed out, I, I work with these people frequently, it's a difficult clinical conundrum where you've got someone who's clearly unwell who would benefit from a whole range of treatments but is unwilling to engage with you. Thank you. Right. Question right at the back in the middle. Gentleman in the middle, yeah. Thank you, I'm John Crowley from the University of Greenwich. Based on the chair's question around um, the, the options that the panel have, who then decides the search strategy and the search terms and whether or not the sort of hierarchy of evidence concept comes into this whole discussion? I, I could just quickly answer that. Uh, that is, sp uh, as I indicated earlier, the scope plays a central part in that. We then involve the whole guideline uh, uh, group in a detailed discussion with our information scientists. Of that, when we're looking at the effectiveness of interventions, we place a premium, as I think everyone in the panel would do here, on randomized controlled trials. But what I hoped I pointed out in my uh, discussion is we contextualize that and a key contextualizing factor, as well as the NHS, for which the recommendations uh, are, are, are being developed, is service user experience of treatment. And that, both in terms of qualitative data we'll look at and the contribution of service users and carers, is a central factor in shaping and developing the recommendations that we produce. Thanks, Steve. Clive, you wanted to say something? I know it's possible. Um, I think that's No, I didn't, I didn't really want to comment on that. I mean, you end up with a huge debate about that, how to do it right. And I think there are genuine worries about what I understand as regards, and I know nothing about science, actually. Um, but I, th I think that's not, I think that level of fine detail, really, is, you know, we can always poke holes in other people's evidence. Uh, we can always point fingers, but 
The issue is the fingers pointing back at ourselves here. And as to whether overall a really potent guidance is unbiased or not. And that's your decision. <laughs> okay, thank you all very much. We are now going to allow two minutes for one of each panel to uh, sum up, and we are going to start with Sonia. Thank you. Um, I, would, I wouldn't like you to be led astray by the very charming speech that Clive made about the nature of bias <laughs> and how we're all biased. I think everything he said is, is quite right, and as I've suggested at the beginning, divine intervention would probably be required to be absolutely without bias. However, returning to Dr. McCabe's introduction, he was suggesting something more serious. He was suggesting not just that we have interests which lead us to having something at stake, but that this guideline was tainted by some serious conflict of interest or lack of attention to due process, that there was really something wrong with the processes we followed and a case to answer. I would suggest that if you think that we were reasonably honest and that, that those kind of accusations are not right, you should vote for the motion, please. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Clive, you're going to sum up for okay, the thank against. You. Uh, nobody's saying that NICE is not an institution struggling to do a good job see that folk are really putting their heart and soul into it. Our argument is that they've lost it on this one. <laughs> and that bias has seeped in, despite themselves. And I think we've presented some evidence of that, all the way through it if you read it, but the research recommendations are a really good one. And you're the Maudsley. You're only one small corner of South East London, but you're a potent one. And you've got a responsibility when you vote here. <laughs> because the world does look at nice guidelines, and I think the world is a bit worried about them. And if you back that up, that will make you look seriously broken up. These guidelines, <laughs> these guidelines are assuredly biased. It's a fantastic job they've done, but they need revised. They could be better, they will be better, I'm sure. We cannot support the motion. Thank you very much. Well, that <laughs> <laughs> That just leaves me to thank you, the audience, and the panel, and I am going to hand back to James now for a recount Okay, so you've heard the evidence on both sides. Um, if you think that uh, the NICE guidelines uh, for psychosis and schizophrenia is unbiased and evidence-based, you should press 1. Um, if you uh, want to vote against that motion, you press 2. And if you're still wanting to abstain, then you press 3. It's coming up, it's coming up. No, Simon says yes. It's fine. Should be okay. Thank you so much. I will 
Okay. So we, ha we have a result. Um, so let me just remind you that um, before the motion, the four side had 63 against 85 and abstentions 127. Um, after the motion, the four side has leapt to 121. Uh, the against side has also increased, but not quite by quite as much, to 117. And the abstentions are very much diminished in number, but there are still 31 abstentions. So um, the motion is carried. Congratulations to the four team and also to all of our speakers and to our chair for a very enlightening debate. Thank you very much. And, uh, and if you'd like to join us, uh, we have some uh, uh, drinks and uh, food in the, in the hub, which you'll find upstairs. Thank you. Let me just say the results. Oh, I'll, I'll, we'll pick it up. There's no feedback, you can't tell when you press the, press the number.